Hi, I'm Thomas Cross Hoops, and I'm a seeker of truth. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. In my pursuit of truth, truth found me, and now I can't stop following him. Join me and my guests as we pursue truth together. Episode 14 of the Seeker of Truth podcast. It's actually part A of the Kevin Bennett episode we shared in uh, episode 11. Uh, we had all kinds of uh, audio and video trouble. We ended up um, recording another one the next week. And so today I spent a lot of time just kind of tweaking it, editing it, trying to make it so you can hear it. You might have to turn it up a little bit uh, just to hear my voice. I uh, forgot to put my microphone in front of my face. But I really enjoy uh, his heart, his intellect, his conversation. Uh, we've become friends and had some conversations offline, and now we've had two on camera. And, uh, yeah, he's just a great guy, has a passion for truth, a passion for people. And uh, I enjoy my time speaking with him uh, both times and definitely look forward to having him on again. So without further ado, here is Episode 14, Seeker of Truth Podcast with Kevin Bennett, a.k.a. The French Accent. Welcome to the Seeker of Truth podcast. I have special guest Kevin Bennett, aka French or French accent. How do you say it? Uh, his Twitter bio reads: Kevin Bennett, aka French accent, at Piano Man sixty nine, musician, comedian, novelist. I don't know what an SEO writer is. Truth teller, follower of Christ, and too cheap for a blue check mark. He had me at follower of Christ. Um, how are you doing, sir? I'm doing all right. Um, good Lord's taking care of me. Doing what I can with what I got where I'm at, essentially. <laughs> That's good stuff. So you came on my radar a few years ago when you were on AGT, and my wife and I watched that show together, and uh, just I, I thought you were hilarious. And I told my wife, I'm like, I, I think he was like a homeschool kid that's smarter than the guys his age. And uh, his outlet is comedy, and she laughed. And, uh, was like, I have Christian homeschool friends that were always smarter than the kids their age, and that's what you reminded me of. Any truth to that? Yeah, very perceptive. I wasn't fully homeschooled. I, I was homeschooled between a year and a half and two years. Um, my mom's a school teacher, and I went to school in first grade at a Christian school for one semester, and she pulled me out. And then she homeschooled me for half a year to a year. I don't really remember. They put me in a different Christian school that wasn't as good. And then the last quarter of the year, right before that, because they did quarters uh, for elementary schoolers rather than just semesters when I was a kid, um, they had me test to re-enter the public school system. And I didn't know this until I was an adult, but apparently I didn't test below fourth grade in any category. So they skipped second they, I skipped second grade. I never went to second grade. I went in the fourth quarter of third grade, and I think I turned seven, or I think I must have turned seven. Um, and then uh, I went through school, and then I was homeschooled again for my seventh grade year, which would have been sixth grade. But I went to sixth grade at a Christian school at the age of fifth graders. So from the time I was little, I was blessed to be extracted from the system. I did, I did first half, I did kindergarten at a secular school, half of first grade at a Christian school, homeschooled, one quarter at another Christian school, a quarter at a secular school, fourth and fifth grade at a secular school, sixth grade in Christian school. I was homeschooled seventh grade, and then eighth through high school, I was in public school. And uh, yeah, it does. It puts you so far ahead. I got to get out of the system and not even understand what an advantage that was because the whole system is about teaching you to be conformed, sort of, to the social... It's groupthink. It's groupthink indoctrination, primarily. Yeah. And yeah. very few people are going to come out of that without being indoctrinated, because it's that's what it is. That's the whole purpose of it. And you are, um, you're punished if you're not indoctrinated. So, I'm a, I'm a bit of a goober, but the good Lord's taking care of me. I love it. And yeah, you, you were sharing a little bit of your testimony before we went live, and so you, you believed in Jesus at three, you went on your journey, didn't didn't really, um, let's say while you were in college, you were really debating the, the Bible and, the, the, you know, it's 
whether it was accurate or not. And uh, you said you got baptized in 2013. So how did you, you found that upbringing in the Christian faith probably kept you from a lot of indoctrination, but yet you still oh, yeah. on your own journey to find Christ for yourself. How did that play out? You know, again, it's, the good Lord's definitely got me on a trek. Um, when I was a kid, my parents loved Jesus, but they were like liberal Christians. Okay, they, they're not that way now. What happened is, as I was being homeschooled, like I told you about, they had to look at the educational materials they were giving me. And they wanted to make sure that they were giving me the straight dope, because I, I wouldn't go to the public school, and they didn't want to screw me up. So they started looking into evolution. And as they started looking into evolution, they realized, you know, we never looked into this before. We were just told this is what it is, and we believed it. And there was a church, a guy named Marty Crump had a church. I don't remember the name of the church. I remember the guy. He was a good pastor. I still know him. Um, he had a fellow named Dennis something or other who had a series called Unlocking the Mysteries of Creation. It was an 18-video set. Very dry stuff. But I love dinosaurs. Who doesn't? Dinosaurs or Trojan Wars. Not Dennis Prager. Uh, Dennis something other. It'd be neat if it were Dennis Prager because we got to take this guy out to lunch. I'd love to have been able to say I took Dennis Prager out to lunch yeah. with us. No, it wasn't Dennis Prager. <laughs> Different Dennis. I, I, I can't remember. His, the series is called Unlocking the Mysteries of Creation. I love dinosaurs. Who doesn't love dinosaurs? Kids love dinosaurs. Um, Dennis, uh, he, he, the, the dinosaurs are used as a Trojan because kids love dinosaurs and the deep time uniformitarian people who want to push the evolutionary faith which is not science. It's pseudoscience. Um, science is observable, repeatable, predictable. This is entirely conjectural that uses um, the sort of evidence you collect at a crime scene rather than... So that evidence is conjectural. It's not, you know, oh, he must have done this, that, and the other thing, and they make a prediction, they try and pr prove it. They're not using, you know, X, Y, and Z. You know, I looked at the moon at this time, at this night and it was at this attitude and I saw it move this direction and I can conclude this. No, they say, I look at the moon at this time and I figure, well, maybe that means that there's aliens. You know, that's, that's the deep time stuff. So, um, a lot of kids are tricked not into, in, into not believing God because the deep time evolutionary people have told them there is no God subtly. And evolution is the way they do that. Well, I love dinosaurs. My parents knew it. So they started looking into this and researching it for themselves. So I, I had to start looking into it because they were taking me along. And I loved it because it was dinosaurs. And then I saw, oh my gosh. I mean, we had, little, we had a picture book that my grandma and I used to read. And it showed the evolution of the horse from a small dog-like creature to a big horse. And I was just so fascinated by that. And this is when I'm five or six years old. Well, I get to see these evolutionary things. And my parents get to see these evolutionary things. And we realize very early on that academia isn't just lying to us in a secular fashion. They're pushing brainwashing propaganda on children and by extension the parents who are just busy working, don't have time to look into it. And they're doing it so successfully most people even in the church didn't know. So my parents were liberal Christians, but then they started to have to really take scripture seriously. Uh, to look into it and understand what was going on. So did I as a little kid. Um, so I, I got to college, and by the time I got to college, I knew Jesus. I believed in what was said in the Bible. But I hadn't actually looked into the Bible enough to understand that it was the inerrant word of God passed down, sort of like a, like a, a tutorial in a video game, if you will. You know, The Bible's like our video game tutorial. The basic instructions before leaving earth, as Kent says, it's the basic tutorial of life that's been passed on to us in a metaphysical way from outside of space and time. That understanding I did not have until the very end of college and even after it. So it's a miracle that, that I came to that uh, perspective because starting out, you know, well, it was cultural. Then we had to look into it deeper, and I believed in God, but the Bible is an inerrant word. Well, I mean, come on, it's, it's a game of telephone, guys. You know, they're not going to get it right. But then I learned of what Kent Hovind had to say and Chuck Missler and all these people. I looked into the Bible. I looked into the Waldenses and the Albigenses and the Dead Sea Scrolls and the Septuagint and how the Old Testament, the New Testament, the Tanakh, the Pentateuch, all these things have been passed down through the eras and what it requires to be a scribe, how you had to ceremonially cleanse yourself each time you wrote the Word of God. you know. And I learned, oh my gosh, this is... 
God's actual word. And then you think about it, and it's not that hard to believe. I mean, how if you can accept God said, let there be light, and there was light. If you can accept that God spoke existence into reality, then you can accept that he got his book published. You know? So, <laughs> right? It's that, I mean, really, you think about it, the whole argument, well, we want to fit millions. Of, well, hold on a second, hold on. You think God can raise himself from the dead and... and, and create the universe, but he can't get a book published? I've got two books published. Nobody's read them. But, so there, there's a big, there, there's a disconnect there if you really think about it. So, that, that it's a long, I mean, if we get into the, this is this this portion alone, I could I could blather on for 12 hours and I've done so. So if you want to, let's do it. But that, that's the, that's the abbreviated uh, version. This doesn't have to be your first time. I'm just, I'm just getting a little glimpse of your heart. Um, you said you got baptized yeah. in 2013. Yes, hadn't even got to that yet. You. That was out of college, early 20s. I got, let's see. How did you start pursuing? Uh, I want to hear how you started pursuing um, comedy, obviously, because that leads me up to how I got to know you was through AGT. So, yeah, let, let's do it, man. And, um, All right. We'll have a late um, night. I have a couple friends that are really into this stuff, and we'll have a late night session where we can just talk about the universe and the creator thereof and everything. I love quantum physics, so we can really go deep into it. And, uh, and oh, I love it. Time sometime. Well, quantum physics is the deal. I mean, what what Tesla said is that the secrets are you got your three six nine, which are some numerical relationships. I've got some theories about that. I don't fully understand, it, but he said everything resonates. And that resonance at a quantum level, they say that uh, three-dimensional shapes are the, is music solidified. Um, so, and you can look at uh, Beetlejuice resonates at a, at a B flat, something like 20 octaves below C major or something. It's every, the, one of the ways they do earth, they, they predict earthquakes is they measure resonance in the earth. And it makes a song, and the song's going to change here and there. So, um, I... Uh, I got into comedy because I got a bachelor's degree in theater. I was going to be an actor. And thank the good Lord, I didn't go to California right after I got into theater. I ended up in porn, and I'm not being dirty. That's just what happens. Um, I got my B.A. in theater from Cornell College in Mount Vernon, Iowa in 2008. I got an A.A. in theater from Casper College in Casper, Wyoming in 2006. And to pay off my theater degree, because Cornell's about 33000 a year, I went to work at a coal mine in Gillette. And um, uh, I was a uh, uh, foundation coal, Bel Air coal mine. I think the mine's still there. I think it's a different company that runs it now. And uh, I was getting five grand a month to drive a haul truck in a circle. It was good money. Paid off my uh, college degree the year I graduated. That was a godsend. The whole reason I got that job, a family friend of ours we knew through the church, um, helped me find that job. So that was all. That wasn't me. That was good Lord taking care of me, despite the fact I went and got a degree in theater like an idiot. And uh, at, at the end of uh, October 2008, yeah, this is just true. I'll, I'll just give it to you straight. The end of October 2008, um, I, was, uh, I was in the haul truck, and they weren't going to let me stay on any longer because I was a summer hire. And I, I, I went and started working in dirt. Long story short, there's overburden removal. There's coal. You have to remove the overburden. That's the dirt before you get to the coal. The dirt trucks do way more loads a day. It's more dangerous work. You don't ever have to do it if you're working in coal as a summer hire. I wanted to work as a full-time uh, miner so I could make up enough money to go out to L.A. My little brain, I was thinking, I'll save up ten grand. i will live in L.A. for six months. I'll audition every single day like it's a job, 40 hours a week, and I'll get one if I just put my nose to the grind. So I, I might have. But I'm in that haul truck sitting under the shovel while it's dumping tons of dirt in the bed. You know those Tonka trucks? That's what I was in, one of those big things. It's dumping yeah. dirt on me. And uh, I said, all right, God, um, heads I go out to L.A., which means I need to find another another mine job because they're not going to let me stay on. Tails, um, I've got an opportunity in Colorado. I could go down there, find a job, and see if there's any artistic theater work I can find down there. So I flipped the coin. It came up, go to Colorado. So I went to Colorado. I got a job at T-Mobile where I worked for from 2008 to 2011, or was it 11? No, 2008 to 2010, that's right. I worked at uh, T-Mobile. I got into the business-to-business -business department, and I was an assistant supervisor. Um, and I looked for comedy when I, right after I moved down there, and I couldn't find it, and I just gave up. 
I just flat gave up. And then in 2010, I, I got fired from T-Mobile, and I started uh, dating again. Well, I didn't get fired. It was a call center. I, I didn't get fired. They, they removed me from one account. It was a call center, and they were going to put me on another one where I'd have to start from zero, and I just said, nah. So um, I, I started dating a gal. It was a bad relationship. It was a sinful relationship. Um, uh, we were not abstinent. I know better. But uh, yeah, I, this is, I was just now learning better. I, I, I rationalized wrongly. Um, and uh, after she broke up with me, I got a DUI, a DWAI rather, driving while ability impaired. And I was very depressed, um, deeply depressed, uh, because it was the worst thing that ever happened to me. Uh, I got broke up with, then I got a DWAI. Oh, great. So um, I, had to, I had to ride a bike. I had to get a new job at IBM. I was working at IBM as a hardware customer assistance technician. And I had to ride a bike to um, the bus. And then I had to take the bus from Fort Collins down to Boulder. It's about 40 miles. So I had to wake up at 4.20 in the morning, ironically. And I got on the bus at 4.45. I had to ride my bike three miles to get to the bus. This is in January of 2011. It was very cold. And I had to do that for a month before I could drive again with an interlock device in my car. And uh, in that depressing, horrible time, uh, which I brought on myself, but only half. I mean, I did bring it on myself, but I came by it honest, yeah. Um, a friend of mine from Gillette uh, told me that there was a comedy show right in uh, Fort Collins. And, you know, I got a BA in theater. I always wanted to try my hand at stand-up. So I rode my bike down there in February of 2011. And uh, when I was a kid, I told jokes, and I played this French character in a play in college. It was uh, Picasso at the Le Pin Agile. By uh, or Le Pont Agile, it means um, Agile Rabbit. I don't speak French. But it's a Steve Martin play, and there's this character named Gaston in there. And right before the play started, they said, Hey, Kevin, put on this accordion. We want you to come in. So I came in as this old, dirty Frenchman playing an accordion, and I stole the show. I didn't mean to steal the show. I was a side character, but the other actors were eh. I mean, they were okay. They didn't really understand their lines. They didn't understand the script. I understood my lines in the script, and I always I loved making people... Laugh. So uh, we only had three big performances of that. I stole that show. Well, fast forward two years, because this was in early 2008. Um, I've got my DUI. I'm depressed. I hear about comedy. I go and I start doing a Scots character. I love to pretend I'm from Scotland. And I tell stupid one liners like, I love blackberries, but as I prefer to call them wee creeps. And uh, I stole the show. I, I, again, I had a great five minutes set and the guy who was running the show said hey there's another show in town uh you want to come check that out and i said yeah yeah sure I'd, I'd love to i'd love to do that so um i went and I, I checked that out and i started doing comedy twice a week on mondays in 2011 until the end of 2012 and i ran into this guy who did a fake scottish thing but he never dropped character he was like andy kaufman like, he pretended to be Scotland when he was talking to you off stage and on stage. He never quit, stayed with it the whole time. And I'm like, well, I'm going to have to figure out something different here because he's already got a headliner set and there's not going to be two of us. So, um, French accent developed out of that uh, because I, yeah, my, my mom had given me an accordion for Christmas. I play keys, you heard my music. I was going to go busk on the street. Yeah. She gave me an accordion I love for it. Christmas. You're very talented. Well, good Lord, give me a gift. But I, it was too complicated to busk, so I just stuck it in the closet. Well, my little brother, they, my folks wanted to send him to Fort Collins to go to school, and they wanted me to be a chaperone, and I didn't want to do it. But there's a really good Christian school down there they wanted to send him to, and they're getting a little too old to do homeschool and stuff. And so I agreed to it, and my keyboard broke, and I picked up that accordion, and that's where French accent came from. I think God let the keyboard break because the, uh, I, I made the right decision for my little brother. So um, while I'm moving from my apartment to this place where my brother's at so that I can be a chaperone, the keyboard breaks, and I start thinking up one-liners with the accordion, and I start thinking, I, you know, I loved Mitch Hedberg, and Mitch Hedberg does one-liners, and every now and again he's got that bass, you know. He'd be like, I, I used to do drugs, I still do, but I used to too. Ba -doo 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 -doo. And some guy in the back is, and I love that dynamic. And so... Perfect storm, it all came together, and I had this eye patch because I played Snake Plissken for Halloween, or not not played, but I, I went to Snake Plissken for Halloween, and I had all these hats because I was an actor. So I got the beret and the eye patch, and 
until the 5th of April, 2023, my very first French accent set was on my YouTube page. But they deleted my YouTube last week because um, I'm, I'm just not even going to, uh, pardon my French, I'm not going to pussyfoot around it. With I'm going to tell the truth. I'm not, I'm not saying I'm as good as Stephen Crowder, but I like his approach to it because so much of the church has this saccharine hallmark feel, I think, really turns people off. But I may be wrong. That's just my opinion. Anyway, um, I started doing French accent at that point. In December of 2011, I got my first paid gig. I went on the road with the, the fake Scots guy I was I, I, I had met for about three months, and I learned how to really, really do good. And then um, I started doing comedy as much as I could, and I was doing great. And then in 2014, there were some new kids on the block, and I I had gotten to, I, I ended up being the old guard. Uh, and it's you know I've only been doing it three years, but I'm the old guard. I was running one or two shows in town, and the new kids on the block showed up, and we accepted them with open arms. Because the way I ran my shows, I don't care if you're left or right, I care if you make the audience laugh. So I would book anybody on the shows I ran that made the audience laugh. That was my criteria. You have, and you got to be a little professional. You know, you got to show up on time, you got to get there on your own. That sort of thing. You know, I'm not going to, I'm not going to come down to Denver and pick you up. Um, you got to make your way up here on your own. And you can't come and bug me the day of and say, I need a, a ride back. Well, fella, you should have figured that out. You're an adult. So that was my criteria. You've got to be professional. You've got to be funny. Well, these guys were little Marxists, you know. And as, as you probably know, being a seeker of truth, Marxism is just rebranded Luciferianism designed as a pyramid scheme so the people at the bottom don't know what's going on at the top. That's all it is. I mean, you, just, you read Marx, you look into Marx, you find out that's what it is. So these people are that way, and they didn't like me. And I actually got in an argument online with a guy who posted on my page without, because I just, you know, in 2013, I got baptized. I, if I saw something, I'd tell the truth. I was talking about how uh, evolution is this or that and the other thing, and I don't believe it. And I was talking about Nephilim and pre-flood um, being a different, the antediluvian world having a different character than the world we're in now. And so he posted that the Pope said evolution was real. And he was trying to make it look like I'm an idiot because, because the Pope said it, so why don't you believe it? And I had to explain to him about this little thing called the Protestant Reformation. I don't know if you've heard of it, but, you know, Protestant Reformation, pretty big deal. Um, I made him look like a total idiot. I, I wasn't trying to be mean, but he was, he, you know, I'm not perfect. Maybe I was meaner than I should have been. But he wanted to talk to me about that, and I thought he just wanted to, you know, uh, go out back, have a little herb, maybe, you know, talk and do a little, uh, do a little, what you may call it, uh, uh, discussion, a little philosophical discussion. He wanted to fight. I didn't know he wanted to fight. He wanted to fight. So um, I, uh, I said, I'm not going to fight you over Christian philosophy. You want to hit me, you can hit me. I closed my eyes. I clasped my hands behind my back. And I let him, and he didn't even, he slapped me. And I, I literally turned the other cheek on this guy, and he thought I was trying to trick him. Like maybe there was a camera somewhere. No, no, I was trying to, I was trying to do what I believed, you know. So he got all freaked out, and, and I said, all right, here's what we're going to do. We're going to walk back to that comedy open mic. I'm not going to say anything. You don't say anything. He said, well, you just better watch your back. I said, what are you going to do? You're going to stab me on my back while I sleep? So we get, to the, we get to the thing, and I hold the door for him, and he spit in my face, and I should have let him spit in my face. Uh, I, wasn't, um, I wasn't Christian enough to do that. I, I love Jesus, but it, it made me mad, so I knocked his hat and his glasses off, and he pinwheeled, and he got me. And before I could get him back, the bouncers pulled us apart. And so this little Marxist Satanist dude, who's a, he was an admitted Satanist, he did everything in his power to try and end my ability to do comedy because of this. And he got people against me, and there were people in Denver who were already of that sort of hipster Satanist bent. They think they're so original, but really, all they're really doing is following what the mainstream media wants them to do, and they don't even know it. They don't know that they're lemmings. They don't know they're not woke. They don't know they're normies. They think that they're egalitarian and brilliant because they're accepting all the perversity. So um, he tried to destroy me, but the good Lord had given me bookings outside of that community through regional bookers. So I was already a, a, a bit too big for that community. So it's like, well, i got to do something. So... I stayed on till 2016, and I prayed over a coin again over whether or not I should get an RV, because I'd seen Breaking Bad, and I figured if Walter White can pick up that 80s RV, a full-size RV for 10 grand, I can find a half-size RV for 5 grand, and I was right. So I prayed over whether or not I should look for one. 
I found one in the mountains of Colorado for twenty-five hundred bucks, a nineteen seventy-eight Dodge Honey. I talked them down to twenty-two hundred bucks. I drove it up to Wyoming. Um, I spent another three thousand dollars making it roadworthy. Didn't work. I mean, every five hundred miles, I'd have to spend five hundred bucks on that stupid thing. And then I drove all the way to L.A. by way of Montana, Washington, Oregon. I made a big circle down, and uh, that was two thousand sixteen. I got on Kill Tony either right before or right after Trump was elected. Um, and then I went back in 2017. I, I was, one episode. Uh, it's the week right before or right after I'll Trump was elected. And I'm the la yeah, I'm the last guy. I'm the very last guy. Um, there, were, there were a bunch of jokes about weed and cats because they're like, wow, you got two cats in your RV? What is that? Cover <laughs> it's pretty funny. Anyway, um, so I got on that. And then uh, Sorry, I came I all had the way. Some Indian food today, and I got spice in my eye. Oh, I thought I was just making you really emotional. I thought I, I thought I was tearing you up. Yeah, man, it's yeah. like it. I, uh, I I love it. There's this Bang Bang Bowls in Seminole Heights. They're amazing, and it's like so much food. I get two meals out of it. I asked for jalapenos. I asked for extra sauce today, and man, I touched my eye and it hurt. Oh man. <laughs> I got, I'm I got sorry. a whole bit I'm, of I'm over here like an audience member. Just, eat. I'm loving this, man. I, 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 you're, you're funny you're good. just telling your stories. I, I, we haven't even done the jokes yet. <laughs> <laughs> well, good. Yeah, <laughs> glad for that. You're good, man. I love pho, P-H-O. It's pho, they say, but I say pho because I, you know, um, and uh, they got this chili sauce <laughs> in there. And I, I know what you're talking about. That stuff, ooh, it's good. It's like you can crunch on that chili. Ooh, I love that stuff. But, um. Yeah, I ended up uh, out in L.A., um, and my first RV, I sold it for $1,200. Bucks. Uh, I think the guy was a meth head. I don't know. I think he was actually doing the Breaking Bad thing uh, because, like, you, you don't buy an, an RV for $1,200. It's like, yeah, man, I'm going to go on a family vacation to the East Coast. I was like, yeah, man, well, you know, just go slow. <laughs> and he paid me in cash. Um, I sold that one, and I found a 1998 Winnebago Rialta I picked up for twelve thousand after taxes because I was I was right SEO you asked or you said earlier that stands for search engine optimization it's basically clickbait with keywords and that's the that's the job the good Lord gave me so that I I was free enough to pursue this stuff and and do anything on my schedule and I do it to a degree still today I mean it's been nearly eight years um, but the way AI is working now a lot of the um, a lot of the jobs are drying up so that kind of sucks. But anyway, I went out there in 2017 again with the new RV, and I came back for Christmas, and there was a group of guys, and I think they're actually, I think some of them might know Jesus too. They're, um, they're the comedy chow guys, and they used to run a comedy show at Hooters on Hollywood Boulevard, and they put a note in their Facebook uh, thread that said, um, hey, bring your network clean stuff. We've got an NBC producer here. So I brought my network clean stuff. And... Uh, what they, it turned out it was a gal for America's Got Talent. And she liked my set, and I got an audition on the show. I didn't think I'd get to go live. I got to go live, and that was 2018. And it did get me a lot of work. I'm really grateful for the experience. I had a lot of fun. Didn't go how I wanted, but I had fun. Um, and now I've got that credit, and they can't take that away from me unless they uh, go ahead and delete. I mean, the truth of the matter is, if God didn't give it to you, you don't really have it. But, um so I, I've got that, and uh, it's gotten me some gigs, and I still do comedy. I do. Uh, I might have. I do as many I, shows I've as I can. Tried it. Oh, it's comedy. Is something if you try it, you of that audition. Go ahead. Yeah, I go found ahead. it on YouTube. I might have to put that in in here. I might have to put that oh, in, yeah. in the uh, in the podcast so people can see it. It's, uh, yeah, go ahead. Uh, for the people who watch that, I had longer hair and eye patch, and I was talking like this. Which is how I, I do my thing, huh? but uh. <sighs> Who's going first? Let's start with what's your name? Please. Francois, Raphael, Edgar, Norbert, Celestine, Herbert, Absent, John, Quarantine, Clement, Emmanuel, Nathaniel, tell us four. The initials of which spell French accent. You, you see what I... All right. Okay. Where are you from? Wyoming, obviously. And how old are you? 30. And very single, ladies. 
Okay. Well, there's a million dollars up for grabs here, French. Yeah, I, I'm just happy to be here. All right, good luck. Are we ready? All right, all right, here we go. My name is French Accent. I'm doing one-liners and puns. For example, I had a girlfriend named Ruth, but then she broke up with me. So now I am ruthless. I ain't even got started yet. Ah, but it's all right. As it says in the Bible, you reap what you sow. She hooked up with a guy named Doug. He broke up with her. Now she's Douglas. What you want, what you really, really want. Oh. <laughs> and that joke is pointless. If you ever meet a girl named Grace, though, don't go dancing with her. Very soon you'll find out she is clumsy. <laughs> that was weird. Well, this is going over like gangbusters. I'm doing just great here. I live in an RV with two cats, and I'd like to change that. Is, is this the, I, I lied, there's only one cat. I had to give the other back, I stole it. I, I'm a cat burglar, all right. Oh. <laughs> all right, my name is Franz Accent, and gonna do some more time for you, but I've got three X's and my self-esteem is very low right now. <laughs> That's funny. The audience is liking me, you two. I don't know. Yeah, listen to that, all right? That's right, yeah. I'm freaking hilarious. I like that. Okay. Let's start with Howie. You know what? Okay, I gotta tell you, you are really funny, you are really unique. Thank you! The key of a really good comic is to play in the moment. And here's a yes. guy who made the three X's really funny, made what was going on in this room really funny. Merci. I just, uh, I loved it. Thank you, Howie! No. Thank you! I'm actually gonna agree with you, Howie, because I'm gonna take my ex back. God bless you! Thank you! I didn't know that. funnier in the moment. That's what made me laugh. Merci. Heidi. You're a real great entertainer. Witty, goofy at the same time. So you want to take your ex back too? Take it back, Heidi. Take your ex back. Take it back. I'm going to take my ex back. Thank you. God bless you. God bless you. Thank you! You are saving my life right now! How is your self-esteem right now? Much better. Good. Danke schön. I'm not going to take my ex back. <laughs> There's got to be a villain. There's got to be a villain. <laughs> I'm going to kick this off with a no. Who cares? Because of us three, I'm going to say yes. Definite yes for me. Three yeses. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Oh, my God. Um, comedy's weird. Comedy is... um. It's something you can't rehearse like you can a monologue. You have to have the audience there because the audience response predicates what you can do in terms of humor. And you can prepare so much stuff that's hilarious and just makes you laugh. And then you try it and you nail your delivery and people look at you like, like you got an eyeball on your nose. Um, it's, that happens and that's part of comedy is you have to keep doing it. So I've got a set. Um, I've got about two hours of material. I would never do more than about an hour and a half straight. I'm most, most comfortable about 45 minutes to an hour. And it's good material. And I, you know, I add new jokes as I can. Um, with COVID, it's thrown a real wrench in things. I've had to sort of restart, you know. And as I told as you heard my story, I already went through quite a bit. Um, and I'm still doing shows, mostly regional, mostly around North Dakota, South Dakota area. But I still get shows and I, I do them. 
And I'm making as much as I was before COVID, but it doesn't mean much. It's um, I'll do one or two shows a month that are like four or five hundred bucks. Whereas out in COVID, I'd have like a hundred dollar show every weekend, but I'd be doing five a week, and I'd see thirty or forty guys who were doing it out in LA. LA is a lot of it a big pyramid scheme, though. What what it, in LA? A lot of the way they make their money is off the stupidity of young people who come out there and spend everything they have, and then they're empty, and now they need whatever they can get, and they end up in porno or something worse. And that that's that's just what happens. Like Van Nuys, Van Nuys in uh, the Valley. So many I, I met so many cute girls from Kansas and Nebraska who you know I, I did extra work on a few movies. I'm in the Deadwood movie as an extra. I've watched it. I can't find where I I'm at, but I'm in it. I got like 700 bucks. Um, and there's so many pretty girls that are no speaking. I mean, we're talking 10 out of 10s and they're just going to tread water until they either decide to play ball with a Harvey Weinstein or not, in which case they have to go do porno. So it's really sad how, how the industry really works. Um, it's very myopic, very nepotistic. Uh, com comedy might be the only way you can backdoor your way in, but now comedy's getting, except for Joe Rogan and Dave Chappelle, it's all... It's all woke, and that kills me because comedians of all the performing arts should be the ones who are calling out the obvious shenanigans we've been seeing for the last three years harder than anybody, and they crumbled like a wet noodle, and I, that makes me so sad about so many comics. But there's a resurgence. I mean, you got your Tim Dillons, you got your Joe Rogans, you got your Dave Chappelles. They're getting after it, and you got guys like me who didn't quite get to that level, but we're still trying. Joe Rogan's doing something special in Houston, and all his boys are moving there. And it seems like, you know, a lot of, like, I saw Joe in Tampa with um, Tony, and I forget the lady's name. But, again, they, they all have different political views, but they're friends, yeah. and they support each other. And they're for free speech. <laughs> and you know what I mean? And so that's all you need. Tony's you a good guy. I met him at the comedy him. store after a, he had me on Kill Tony about a month after and he, he said something to the effect that don't let the bastards get you down, basically. He said, you're going to hear a lot of BS from a lot of people. Mm. Don't mm. let them. Don't let it mess you up. And he's right about it. It's good advice. And I don't think he's conservative. I think what it is is with Joe, Joe Rogan and Tony, I think these guys are intellectually honest, and they were raised on the propaganda of the school system. And the end result is, you know... They, they know there's a lot of lies going on, but they were inculcated with the ideas of deep-time evolutionary, mechanistic, postmodern perspectives from the time they were little. And getting past that's really hard. But I think they're intellectually honest. So I, I got I to gotta say there's a lot going on um, because on one hand you're creative and you're an artist and we could just talk about that, but you're clearly a free thinker and I, I do believe that God's calling you to be a true speaker to the environment and you're going to find your niche because, uh, you know, you were just canceled of your YouTube channel. Um, so <laughs> as, as we post this on seekeroftruth.co, we're going to have a link to your new Rumble. It's brand new, so everybody, if you don't have a Rumble account, you need to create a Rumble account because... You can still have your YouTube, but it is the only thing that's going to keep YouTube honest. Um, it is where all the gamers are going. It is where the free speakers and the podcasters are going. It is just something you, YouTube will silence you if you say the wrong thing about you know COVID or the wrong thing about anything. And uh, it's important as, as free thinkers and believers, we should all uh, go to this other channel, at least have an account. I'm not telling you to cancel your YouTube account, but you definitely should create a Rumble account. Follow my Rumble. There'll be a link on it. Follow Mr. Kevin Bennett, a.k.a. French Accent. He's going to start putting up some of his older material again that, that's been lost on YouTube. Um, but I'll, I'll have links to his Twitter. Support him. Thank you. Um, Thank you for that. And also, um, Rose. Yeah. make sure and send me your Rumble link so I can follow you. I didn't, I didn't realize you had a Rumble, too. I need to follow that for sure. But thank you. Yes, and I 100% I agree. I mean, YouTube... They don't even play by their own rules when they cancel you. Go ahead and finish what you were saying. I'll, I'll tell you how I know that. No, I'm just sharing that, you know, God's given you a platform and, and seems like things have been trying to take it away. And you're, you're definitely someone like on Facebook, you're going to share the, the things that question, you know, the shutdowns or COVID. And for that reason, you're blacklisted, right? You don't have a platform Joe Rogan has. So you weren't um, immune to the censorship. And, 
That's a, so you do have to be careful where you say what and what you say um, for to keep yourself on there. But I do believe you're going to continue to think outside the box and even bring solutions to the world's problems. And God's obviously given you a quick wit and a high intellect for a reason. And I, I think it's great. So I look forward. Well, to thank you. Uh, and, and you know, you I would today. say this. I'd love to see if there's any any jokes you want to tell me, man. Get, give it to them. If you get in character, we'd love to hear some. Uh, I got. I'd have to go grab my accordion to be fully in character. It's in my car, but I can throw some one-liners at you. I want to say this. YouTube. Um, yeah. You you can't. YouTube is not. Um, they don't play by their own rules, and. There's nowhere you won't be silenced eventually. What needs to happen, I don't, you know, you got your Tim Pools and your Steven Crowders and these people who, who pass the gatekeepers and they're past the gate. Those people who are past the gate, they make so much money for YouTube, they've got lawyers and legal teams. And if YouTube doesn't play by their own rules, those people can afford to have their lawyers and legal team fix YouTube and keep them honest. But unless you've already made it past the gate, I don't think it's worth worrying about because all you're going to do is you're going to waste time diluting the truth that is true and eventually they're going to shut you down anyway. So YouTube right. says they're supposed to give right. you three strikes and then you're out. So I got a strike in January because I said something to the effect of COVID, but it's real mild. It's really just a souped up cold that they selectively reported on statistically in order to stimulate panic so that they could have a mail-in vote election and push this vaccine. The whole thing, totally unnecessary. Uh, it was no more dangerous in 2020. And this is something, you, this segment you should probably edit out for YouTube on your own, but it was no more dangerous in 2020 than it was at any other flu year. In fact, the flu has killed over 100,000 in a year before in like the 70s. Like I think the year of Woodstock, the flu was that bad. Um, so the whole narrative was complete propaganda designed to leech off of our faith in the state as a means of stealing our freedoms and consolidating power among the elite is all it was. And it was, it's been planned. They've been talking about this stuff since H.G. Wells. And H.G. Wells, Fabian Socialist, he wrote The Shape of Things to Come. You've got to check out Jay Dyer's analysis. He goes into this stuff. But... He, he was a big proponent of a globalist situation. And that's what we're seeing, really, is the perpetuation of a globalist state, and that's necessary for the events in Revelation. That's why I knew about this stuff, is because of the book of Revelation. You can't have a mark of the beast unless you have a consolidated global infrastructure. A consolidated global infrastructure means getting all the people together. Okay, So... Uh, with YouTube and, and these, these propaganda outlets, I had said something to the effect that is just another cold. It's real, but it's not any more dangerous than the flu. And if you didn't wear a mask in 2019, you shouldn't wear one in 2020. I mean, if you were had a, an immune system thing in 2019 and you were already, yeah, yeah, you'd wear one. But that's like one out of 20,000 people, you know. So I said something to that effect and they gave me a strike. Okay, I knew they were going to give me crap on the, on the thing, whatever. Well... In March of 15, I posted something on Facebook where I just went live and talked for an hour about stuff. Because Instagram got taken away from me. They took away my Instagram account because I said they need to hold Joe accountable for wars and pandemic enforcement that have killed thousands, if not millions of people. He needs to, be, uh, he needs to go before a military tribunal and they need to hang. And that's just my opinion. That's not encouraging violence. You don't say put them in front of a court if you're encouraging violence in the street. If I had said that about somebody who doesn't support trans, they wouldn't have said If I had said hang Jordan Peterson without any context, they'd have been fine with it. If I had said hang Alex Jones, if I had been like Kathy Lee Griffin and held up a severed effigy of Donald Trump's head, they'd have been fine with it. But because I, I said what I did, and it's perfectly reasonable and scriptural, uh, there is room for authorities holding wicked people accountable who hurt the innocent. Because I said that, they gave me a strike. And that meant I couldn't post or say anything for a week. Okay, whatever. Uh, March 15th, sorry, that this, the second strike came March 15th when on YouTube, or I, I shared my Facebook video on YouTube. They took that down, they gave me a second strike. Two weeks later, right as the, my second strike was coming to a close, they demonetized me. 
April 5th, they deleted my channel. Now, in their own guidelines, they're supposed to give you three strikes. You get one strike, you get two strikes, the third one, you're out. They only gave me two, then they demonetized me, then they deleted my channel. Now, this whole time, I would send one-minute videos, because I was doing this, this New World Origami thing. I would send one-minute videos up to YouTube to take advantage of their shorts feature. And they would put a yellow dollar sign on mine to say it shouldn't be monetized. And I would challenge it. And the next day, they'd give me a green dollar sign. And this happened several hundred times, and I kept every single email. So what am I getting to? YouTube's rules and policies are whatever YouTube wants them to be. They're totally vague. And they selectively enforce them for the purposes of advancing their own narrative. So if you're quiet and you don't tell the truth, it doesn't matter. If they're able to suss out that you are getting a following and you're doing a good job and you're influencing people and it's in a way they don't like, they'll just delete you under uh, pretenses that have nothing to do with their... They did that to Lance Walno. Lance Walno is about as... I mean, he's Christian. I wouldn't say he's milk toast, but he's... You know, he's he, salt is spicy to Lance Walno. He's not going to put great. pepper on his sandwich, yeah, you know? know. They deleted know. his whole channel. I, and I like great. him. I like him. They deleted his whole channel. And I'm way spicier than him, but he's they shouldn't have deleted it. The reason they did is because he was becoming influential. So they just use YouTube to exalt the voices they want and to minimize the voices they don't want. And if that voice gets loud, even though they're trying to say no, then they just delete it. So go to Rumble. Go to Rumble, stay on Rumble. Let them YouTube cheese weasels eat the cheese and get indigestion. I don't know. Well, you you brought you brought up a good point. Um, you know, I mean, obviously Joe Rogan went to Spotify. Um, Tim Pool, I really like him, and he's building out his own platform and his own thing. Like they're gonna try to use like I, I think um, I think Stephen Crowder finally isn't even doing anything on YouTube because he went to Rumble. Um, yeah. They weren't going to get money. They demonetize you, like you said. They just make it so you can't... So so that's what Joe Rogan talks about. They make it so you self-censor. And you'd think, in like in a faith-based Christian podcast, you wouldn't need to worry about it. But you said Lance Wall now, God. <laughs> you know, he's as Christian as they get. Um, yeah. Sometimes there's truth that's going to be spoken that is going to be counter to, you know... It's one thing to talk about mm -hmm. Jesus and talk about all the great stuff but if you talk about any societal things going on at that point they're gonna they're gonna mess with you and oh yeah yeah, it yeah. well problem but that, that's we're dealing with narrative. you could be what be, yep so you know god is in control i like how you keep referring to revelation um i just think i hope we can delay as much trouble um i mean to be honest i lived in china for a few years i've traveled the world three five continents, 36 countries, and, you know, the countries that have more strict uh, rules against religion have a stronger faith. Um, it's almost like we're getting to the point where everything's going to be permissible but the Christian faith, which will cause it to grow more in the long run. It'll be a good thing, but it, it does. It's going to cause hardships on believers, and, you know, it's part of the game. Um, it's no fun to have hardships, but it's part of life, and Jesus said, in this world you will have trouble, but take heart, for I have overcome the world. So, you know, I could see it coming to a point, you know, where it becomes black and white and you really have to decide what what you're going to do and what you're going to say. But um, I do also like to stand up for truth and speak truth. Um, so I do want to see us get the same voice as everybody else and the same respect and honor that, that people with different opinions get. So. Amen. And, you know, I agree. Um China, before COVID happened, Chinese Christians, and there might be as many Chinese Christians, I think there's over 100 million Chinese Christians, or it might be 50 million, but it's a country of a billion. That's amazing when you think about it. And the Chinese government persecutes yeah, the crimson bejesus out of them. They, they, they persecute them, and a lot of the churches are underground. There's a state Chinese church, but it's not really a church. It's just the communists are pretending, and everybody knows it. But they've been praying that Americans would get persecuted. Because of what you just said, which is that the persecution makes you stronger. And it says in Scripture, we're made perfect in weakness. And I understand that here, but it hurts here. And I know God's doing what He's supposed to do, what he, what he, what's right, what's the best thing to do. Not what He's supposed to do, what He intends to do. I know He's doing that. But here and here, there's a... Mm. But uh, what, what you were talking about with Revelation, 
You know, I don't think we can avoid it, but I think we can delay it, like you were saying. I think we are, the, the Holy Spirit's inside of us, He's the Comforter and He's the Restrainer. And I think we can delay the events of the 70th week of Daniel. I don't, I don't think we can stop them, because otherwise there wouldn't be a book of Revelation. That's an ultimate punctuation point on the paragraph of mankind. But we can make it a run-on sentence. And we can, you know, I'm talking run-on sentences. Well, and, we can keep that going. To, yeah. Well, we have to remember, um, you know, there's this focus, like, what was it, Batman, The Darkest Night? And, you know, as the uh, as the darker it gets, the more light there is, you know, as, as sin becomes great, grace becomes greater. And, and God's love will always prevail. So that's one thing to remember. I'm not fearful um, of of persecution or of of crazy times that may come hundreds of thousands of years from now or next year, right? We don't know what it's going to be like. But um, sometimes it's easier to just have that faith for the big, you know, if the worst thing possible happened, I have faith in Christ, right? If yeah. it doesn't, I want to make sure along the way I'm doing everything I can in my power to protect my family, protect myself, and to show the goodness of God to the world. And uh, that that's something that happens. A lot of times the enemy tries to get us fighting in the physical realm when mm. it's not those Marxists that we're at war with. It's it's the spirits of the age. It's it's you know, it's it's the enemy within and yeah, they've just they've just got that veil and and it's, it reminds me of Hebrews where when when we look to the law, the veil covers our faces. So there's there's believers in Christ that are literally walking around with a veil covering their eyes because oh, yeah. you look to the Lord who is the spirit, the veil is removed and you know, I, I'm remembering 20, 30 years ago, the grace message was just going through the churches, and it was dividing churches because some people hold on. They want to hold on to that law and their own ability to, uh, you know, dictate their salvation. You sound like you know Joseph Prince. You, you know Joseph Prince talk about raw and grace? You know him talk about that in the earth? I, get a, I like he's a Joseph good. Prince. He talked about the raw and grace? No, he's better than that. Yeah, yeah. Your other accent is better, but uh, he's he's got a better accent. But yeah, he does so better, I, but I he's saying the earth. Fist and Andrew Womack. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. He I didn't know who he was at first, and I was mixing him up with a different person. And um, I know my dad liked Joseph Prince, and uh, man, yeah, he's he's something else. But, Law and Grace, though, you're right on. Reminds me when when you get that mix. Yeah, yeah, right. You're right on with Law and Grace it because gets into uh, that. Yeah, yeah, because. The whole thing, um, not that that's that's the whole. People don't understand the concept of sin, because in Greek the term sin is hamartia, which literally translated is missing the mark. Now in Hebrew, sin they worshipped a god called sin, and this quality of imperfection they likened in a metaphorical sense to sin, and that's where we get the word the translation. But the Greek word hamartia is what they used. To, sit, to communicate the same mark, uh, concept. So here's Hamartia, missing the mark. Yeah. You can't miss a mark you're not aiming for. What they're saying is, even if you try to get it right, you're a bad shot. It's not that you're, you're even trying to be bad. You're bad because right. you're imperfect. The concept of sin, for all of sin and fallen short of the glory of God. Well, some of those sins are people being wicked. Some of them are neglecting to do the right thing they didn't know they needed to do. They're sins of omission and sins of commission. The state of right. sinfulness is the state of imperfection. We're just not a turn. We're all going to die. We're not supposed to die. That's Adam's sin. We're supposed to right. earth life here on earth. It's like kindergarten. We're, we're supposed to learn our letters, learn our numbers. <laughs> and then I think what God's original plan was, and I don't know because I'm not God, but I think once we learned enough in this corporeal, physical realm, he, we graduate. And that was the whole purpose. This, this whole earth is like a playground. But the very first lesson, yeah. Adam failed. And why did he fail? Eve was pretty hot. She was pretty hot. I mean, she yeah. was not an ugly bugly. Yeah. She was, you know, she, she, was she, had a couple, <laughs> she had some pomegranates, what I'm talking about. But that's what it is, is Adam knew that if he didn't take that fruit... That Eve would be subject to God's wrath, whatever that was. He didn't know what that was. So even though he sinned, and this is in the New Testament, the reason Christ is called the second Adam is because Eve was deceived, but Adam was not. 
part of the reason he bit that apple, or whatever it was, we don't know what it was, part of the reason he bit that fruit was because he didn't want to see her get destroyed. So that was self-sacrificial, even though it was sin. And people don't get that distinction. But it was it's something I just recently came across and did not understand until recently. Um, go back and read the story, and you find that God's intent was never punishment. It was right. actually repentance and reconciliation. When he came in the garden, he wasn't, where, you know, I want to smite you. He was literally asking them where they were. And had they yeah. turned their face back to the Lord, just as he wants us to do now, in our sin, in our shame, God is there saying, come and look to me. You know, when he said the sins of the earth have been, you know, forgiven on Jesus, it's for the whole world. Every sin that ever will be committed has already been judged on Christ. He doesn't go back to the cross. I remember hearing that when I was a kid. Every time you cuss, it's like you're driving a nail into Jesus. That's not theology. That's not biblical. No. So, so this, this missing the mark, we were missing the mark. God's, God said the angels came and they said, peace on earth, goodwill towards men. You know, I've made peace with the earth. Right? It's not peace on earth like we have peace. No, God made peace with us. And his wrath was poured out on Christ once and for all. In the garden, yeah. he came and he said, Adam, you know, he was calling his name. He wanted him to come to him and look him in the eyes and walk with him in the stillness and the coolness of the earth. And instead, they had a punishment paradigm. They were afraid. They, they had no reason to be afraid except that their eyes were open to the law, to, to you know, the, the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And had they not well, understood that, they, yeah, yeah, and and you so, know, so where uh, I was going I, I, with that was, yeah, we got a delay. Yeah, you got you, next time you have that better internet, we got a little a little bit of delay, but um, I'm, I'm as long as we talk one at a time, it'll be fine, and I can edit it out. But uh, it's just funny to me because we're talking about these topics, and the main thing, like, well, I'm only here today because, um. At 41 years old, I finally understand this what maturity really is, and that I'm loved and accepted as I am. Brennan Manning is one of my favorite authors, if you know who that is. Uh, Abba's Child, Ragamuffin Gospel, and so God loves you as you are, not as you should be. And then I understood that I can mature because I'm no longer in fear. So even where there's areas that need to mature and grow, God's not angry with me along the way. He's perfectly pleased with me along the way. And what Pastor Caleb from my church just said on my podcast that came out yesterday, and it, it put words to what I've been saying and sharing for a while. But he said, we are not growing in holiness. We're growing in our revelation of Jesus' holiness in us, right? So literally, we are sanctified and whole immediately upon receiving the Holy Spirit and receiving our salvation. Thief on the cross. On our earthly realm, we talk about... Yeah, we talk about sanctification. We talk about this progress. Well, the progress is literally just a maturing because we are pure and holy in God's eyes because we're in Christ. And and that's when I don't do you ever heard of Graham Cook? He's a really awesome guy, too. And uh, he's yeah, just I, I don't know him well. But yeah. God, God placed us in Christ so that we could come boldly before the throne. How else are we seated in that many places? We couldn't without being in Christ. So it's just all these concepts that if you start to understand them in your heart and believe them. You start to have a different experience with life, and then those sin issues and those guilt issues and those shame issues, oh. they start to fall away as you go through maturity because they no longer have power over you because there's no more fear of punishment because God isn't going to punish you. And, and sure, in the end, that's different, but I'm talking about believers now learning to walk in the love and grace of God. Like if we believe God saved us like you were talking about going to heaven, then we have to believe that he's already sanctified us. It's the same faith. It's the same thing. He, he, we have faith that Christ. So that's one thing I always laugh at. People believe God that they're going to go to heaven, right? But that's something that we can't prove. And they don't believe that God loves them as they are. They don't believe that God's healed them on the cross already. That, you know, my mind has been healed where I had blockages and issues. And, you know, it's like it's the same belief system. And definitely someone for you to check out is Andrew Womack. Andrew Womack. If you haven't checked, I know him, about him. David, but he's, he's, he's good. Saying, he's good. I love. Um, you were in Colorado. You were in yeah. Colorado. Yeah, I dated a I dated a gal whose mom really liked Andrew Womack. That was a weird situation. But um, so side weird. note, um, what you were saying, you know, Christ died on the cross, was rose again. He took all the sins of mankind on him. The the, the people don't understand it because they're not 
off and looking at it with the right framework. And I think I've got a framework that's helpful. And I've been saying it a lot over the years. We're in a painting. We're in a tapestry. We're in a computer simulation. The painter already made the painting. The, the tapestry has been woven. The simulation has been programmed. Now, Super Mario hopping around in the Mushroom Kingdom, right? He's looking at a castle. That castle was there before he was born. And his little mind, uh, it's hundreds of years old. But we know it didn't happen until the 1980s, right? That's a simulation. It's a video game. It's a subset of a greater reality. And the time and space of Super Mario World is not the time and space of the world that created Super Mario World. We're in the same place. Our time and space was created by God. Time and space are like colors on his palette. So he's not bound by time and space. God isn't out there in some planet elsewhere in the universe. He created all the universe, all the planets, like a programmer might create uh, Endless Sky or Forever Sky or No Man's Sky, that video game where it just keeps generating planets and it's got more digital space than there is in the earth. But it's, it's all, it's a subset of a greater reality. So God, God can look at this human being from the time they're a piece of, um, from the time they're a piece of metal to the time they're minted into a quarter at the factory and God can put all his attention on that piece of metal from its inception to the time it has spent its last uh, cent 200 years from now. And then he can pull out of space and time and go right back into the simulation and, and, and then he can, look at, he can look at the quarter's brother, the other one, and he can spend all his time and attention on this one in the same way. Like, so right now what I'm thinking and right now what you're thinking, God can see our thoughts before they happen, as they happen, and where they'll go, and he can spend his full attention on them. And then when you and me are dead, he can go to our brother or our sister and do the same thing. So the way we look at the world we live in, we're in this universe designed to shape us into what we're supposed to be eternally. And we're told by these churches before the grace movement, and I was as a kid, like you were saying, you know, um, every time you're doing something, it grieves Jesus. Well, you know, I'm sure he doesn't like it when we're jerks. I'm sure he doesn't like that. But the concept right. of eternal life and salvation and sins being forgiven, Jesus had to forgive our sins in the future on the cross in the past. And he had to forgive Moses' right. sins in the past when he was in the future on the cross. The concept of time and space, God's outside of it. And people don't understand that in the church. Right. They think of God as off on some cloud or some planet somewhere because of all the Renaissance iconography. But that's nowhere in Scripture. Scripture's connotation is that God is outside of it all and that he came in through right. Jesus. Jesus is like God playing the video game he designed, if you will. <laughs> that's actually kind of cool. Yeah, I, and just recently in my... In the Bible school class, they're, you know, talking about the, the Kairos time versus the Kronos time. And, you know, we walk through the Kronos time, you and I, together, the chronological time. But the Kairos time is, is kind of where heaven invades the earth time. And, um, mm. you know, I like that God's outside of time. Um, you know, people have experiences where the Lord will take them back to a memory and heal it. And all of a sudden their life is changed from, from that point on because an area of pain or hurt was healed. Um, over the internet, man, in 2008, there was kind of a wild and crazy revival going on in Lakeland, Florida. And uh, I would have that on in my 14 hours ahead in Beijing. So I'm 14 hours ahead, and my whole room would fill out with the presence of God. Sometimes I couldn't get off the couch. I was laughing. I mean, it was wild, but it was beyond time. And I've listened to things recorded in cool moments i've listened to prophetic words i've gotten from 2008 2009 and they hit you in your spirit like they were just said now so that kind of stuff is cool to me too things can be on audio recording podcasts and they god will use them beyond the time that they were even intended for it's pretty cool stuff yeah i think it's the I only real time travel proves god yeah yeah right like you can I wonder very much, now I don't know the truth of this, this is just a speculation based on that concept, but say you're watching a sports game that's already happened. Can you pray about that game and how it proceeds as you watch it in the future? I think you might be able to. And because of what you said about Lakeland, I remember the Lakeland Revival. 
You're in Beijing, 14 hours ahead. You're in a different time space. You're in the future from that revival, but what happened in the past is directly affecting you in the present. <laughs> so they've time traveled to your yeah, brain through the through technology. So I wonder very much, and I'll do, I'll do this sometimes. I'll be watching a news report that's from the past, and I'll be praying for the people in it. Not because I'm praying for the dead or anything, but because I know God's outside of time and space. And God knows that when I see that report, even though it happened a year ago, it's going to influence me here and I'm going to pray. So God knows that from outside of time and space. So he can retroactively apply that prayer in the present when it happens before I pray it, if he wanted to. Does he do that? I don't know, but he could That's if he crazy. wanted. <laughs> yeah, it's like this balance of the finished works of the cross, that Jesus doesn't have to do anything ever again, that he's literally already made a way for our healing, for our salvation, for our... You're everything. So God's not up there like a puppet moving every time someone gets saved. Right. But at the same time, we're growing and maturing in our awareness of what God's doing around us so we can come into agreement with him and partner with him. So it's like these two things going. God isn't really needing to do anything. He's already done what he's going to do. That's the finished works yeah. of the cross. But now I can be mature and grow up into the Lord to follow the Holy Spirit, to be his hands and feet and release his goodness and his mercy and his like God's, you know, everyone wants to see God's glory and his goodness and his, well, aren't we supposed to have that and let that out of us, right? And so I think that's part of it is as we're maturing, I heard someone talking about, you know, a lot of times there's a big thing in that same period or it was, you know, commanding the angels, that we could command the angels where God, you know, to do what we needed them to do for God. And it's like, I heard another preacher recently say, I don't need to command the angels. God's doing something. I need to see what they're doing and ask God, you know, what are they doing? What am I supposed to partner with? What do you want me to do? What do you want me to come alongside? And, you know, it's it's two different ways of thinking about it. Because, well, that said, too, uh, prayer is like very... This concept. Yeah, pr prayer is very important, too, because, um, I mean, Daniel was praying and fasting for a very long time, and the angel was withheld by the prince of Persia as he came to Daniel to give him the prophecy yep. uh, that, that ultimately... Uh, left that suspended 70th week of Daniel. So in the prayer realm, in the spiritual realm, things we do in prayer do affect the outcome of events. But it's it's yep. it's not that God couldn't do it without us. It's that we're we're aligning our conscious. It's a love action. It's like a, it's like a kid. It's like a kid. And C.S. Lewis talks about this. You know, you give your kid ten bucks and they buy you a present for Father's Day. Well, it's not like they actually made you any richer. I mean, that's your own money you gave them, right? But you're happy for it. They're, they have, you know, they've shown love. It's a similar thing between us and God. C.S. Lewis makes that comparison. I think he's on point. Are you? So did you see that thing that just went around on Facebook? Because I wasn't aware of it till now. But that the actual author of The Matrix and of Terminator was a black woman that the stories were together and they were like Neo's like the Christ figure and Neo's actually the grown up version of John Connor from, I had no idea. This same woman wrote both stories and got taken. I'm going to have to look into it. Her work. I'll send you the video cause she's credible. She's yeah. on lawsuits. She really is the author that they stole the ideas from. And, um, but I I'll have know, to look into it. Said the matrix is like, yeah, they always said the matrix is like the kingdom of God and it's this red pill, blue pill, and we're supposed to be living by the spirit, not the flesh. And I, I, it's something I'm barely tapping into. And I think you would say we could both grow in learning to live out of our spirit and not our what we see with our physical eyes. Like there's a story from a, a famous um, Chinese pastor. I think his name was called the Heavenly Man, and it's worth reading. But uh, he was one of those guys that met the Holy Spirit in the middle of nowhere, dirt poor, you know, didn't even have a Bible. And, you know, God got him a Bible, and he's in prison in China. And he had no Bible, but God, like, he memorized the whole Bible. And when he was getting smuggled out of China, this is back in, I don't know, 70s, 80s, they already had, like, closed circuit cameras. And he's walking through the airport, and the Holy Spirit was telling him when to move. They had voice recognition, so he wasn't supposed to speak. He was literally just being guided by his spirit where to go, and he got out, and he lives in Germany. And But his story is amazing. This guy sees miracles all the time. He's just one of those guys that literally put God first in his life in every aspect, and he's he's someone that lives out of his spirit and lives in the spiritual realm, 
the physical realm is secondary to him, which you do that in America and people make fun of you. I have some really close friends I lived with in China and people used to sort of make fun of them. They used to, uh, you know, ask God which fruit to buy and stuff like that. And they just, they wanted to include God in everything. And I can say, I don't do a good job of that. And, you know, tr or that we can live out of our spirit and our spirit connected to the Holy Spirit, we could literally live a better life. I, I remember um, Andrew Womack was warned in the spirit not to get on a plane and the plane crashed and he just, he didn't go on that trip. He felt like he wasn't supposed to and unfortunately other people were on that plane but things like that can happen if we learn to live out of our spirit, you know? <laughs> like, yeah. um, I think they did say something. Yeah, so... Well, I don't, I don't, I agree with, I agree with that a hundred thousand percent. Oh, I agree a hundred percent on the spirit thing. And that's one of the reasons I flipped the coin. Actually, it's because I know God knows the outcome and I don't know the outcome and God knows I don't know the outcome. And I'm just trying to make the best choice without knowing what it is. So the reason I'm flipping that coin has nothing to do with the coin. It's not a talisman or anything like that. It's that I need a binary way like drawing lots or the putting a fleece out as Gideon did because I don't know what to do and I can see the right of, of both ways. So I'll pray over a coin and flip it. And the whole reason I started doing that is because of what you're saying. We don't know the domino effect of even the smallest decision. Even the smallest decision can have huge implications. And if we allow God to direct our decision-making process, then he can bless us. And the truth is, he doesn't want to mess with us. We are in this testing ground, and if we're following him, nothing's bad going to happen. But here, here's the thing. If you're lifting weights, that, that hurts. If you're running, you get tired. If you're going to build muscle, there's pain first. Otherwise, you can't build muscle. And it's the same spiritually in a different way. So the saints, the people who follow God, those of us who really want to do it his way, we're going to go through hard things. And that is a blessing because unless you go through the hard thing, you can't become better. You have to, you have to lift the weights to get the muscle. And what God is doing is he's taking us through a weights course. But we're not actually, you know, fighting the, the big guy. We're in a gym. And it doesn't feel like it, though. And I, I can say this, and I know it here, but in here the emotions still get me all the time. I even know I know better. But with the Matrix Terminator thing, I, you know, it'd be neat if that were true. I don't know for sure. Here's what I know. James Cameron says he wrote the first Terminator overnight. And he just got so inspired. Could be lying. He could have just plagiarized wow. it. I don't know. She won lawsuits. The, you, I'll send you yeah. the video. Please do. And, and, and the, the Wachowski lawsuits. brothers? They, they both. They yeah. Stole the Wachowski the brothers, they think they're sisters now. So James Cameron's a stinker. He's never done anything as good. True Lies is the best thing he did. After that, it's all a wash, in my opinion. And the Wachowski brothers, the only good thing they did was that first Matrix. The stuff they did before sucked. The stuff they did after sucked. And now they suck too. So, uh, you know, I, I could believe it. I could believe they stole it and pretended it was theirs. But I don't know. I haven't heard that before. Hi. Thank you so much for listening. Please like and subscribe to the Seeker of Truth podcast. And also visit our website, seekeroftruth.co, for more information about all of our guests and how you can hear more from them. I pray this conversation encouraged, uplifted, and inspired you to pursue truth at a deeper level.